Welcome back. Okay, we have another morning together. And in keeping with my commitment this weekend to give our viewers what they want, uh, I've been asked to do a haul video. Now, my haul videos are not going to be like Jocelyn's because we have different goals in our online selling. So, mine is going to be more me, a little more teaching. Now, I will see you when we get back and we'll get into it. got here. Everything on this table is Japanese porcelain. And I wanted to show you because people have been asking, why do I always grab the Japanese stuff? And I assume that a lot of you think I grab it because I like the Asian aesthetic, because I collect rose medallion china. And that's only kind of sort of true. Right now, I am gobbling up Asian pieces because I know they are the coming thing, which means right now they can be had at bargain prices. And in six months, eight months, two years, who knows, I don't have a crystal ball. The market is just going to continue to improve. And what we buy for a few bucks now, we can sell for 20 or 30 later. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we are buying for a few bucks now, we can sell for 20 or 30 right now. And that's what I want to show you. Now, I'm going to start with some salt and pepper shakers because these are things that you have not seen. Um, I did not pick them up with Jocelyn, so they're not on the Crazy Landlady videos. But let's take a look at these little guys. Ma and Pa Goose. These are Japanese-made salt and pepper shakers post-war. So we're looking at post-occupied Japan. Um, best guess is maybe 55 to 65, 1955 to 1965. It's a guess. Um, really nicely done. These salt and pepper shakers, since this is supposed to be a haul video, let's talk about this. Um, I bought these for $3 a piece, all of the salt and pepper shakers here. Now, I probably could have gotten them for less. I bought them from a woman I know who was selling them for her mother, and her mother is elderly, and she's using the money for the vet bills for her sick cat. So naturally, I was not going to haggle. Uh, I want the cat cared for. So I paid $6 for this set. I usually get sets like this, as you know, at Community Aid or the Goodwill for less than half that. Nevertheless, these are nice. And if I saw them at the Goodwill or Community Aid for $6, you better believe I'd buy them. Pieces like this would ordinarily go in the range of 20 to 30 dollars if i threw them on ebay at auction i would probably expect to do a little more why beautiful execution and whimsy salt and pepper shakers are the sorts of things that people buy for the whimsy factor another similar set mon pom mouse here we go. These are just, boy, this is a lot. Look at Pa Mouse there with his little tie and so on. And here's Ma. These are just delightful, cartoonish, but beautifully done. Um, I love the gradation in color where it will start off very light, move into a very dark shade, or in the case of Ma, into a completely different shade. Beautifully executed. Again, six dollars 
what would I expect them to go for 20 or 30? Um, and pieces like this, because of the unique whimsy factor at auction could go a lot higher, especially if you have two or more people who are determined to add them to their collection. Because let's face it, that may be a lot of money for a pair of salt and pepper shakers, but it's not a lot of money if you're adding to a collection and people will pay for what they want. Um, this is a piece you've seen. I don't remember what I paid for this. It was a dollar or two at Community Aid. Jocelyn picked it up, looked at it, said, I don't want it. Do you want it? I said, oh, yeah. So a Japanese piece. This is definitely 1950s. I remember this sort of thing from my childhood. Every little girl's bedroom had something like this. Uh, I believe they came in pink and yellow as well. Cheap. You got them at, at Woolworths at, at the local Five and Dime store. I would be surprised if this piece, brand new, cost even half what I paid for it at the thrift shop. Um, they were not designed to be high ticket items, but they're lovely. Um, very well executed. Again, the soft, subtle shading on the paint. Love the daylights out of these. They are already appreciating in value. This is something that I've seen over the last few years. These Japanese pieces going up and up and up. People looking for marks. This one, Japan. Um, occupied Japan. So we should probably just backtrack a minute and talk about Japan, um, Japanese porcelain as it has been imported into the U.S. in the 20th century. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of, well, it's only the 20th century. It's only 100 years. It's not a real history lesson in Japanese porcelain. But the early stuff, here we go. this is a very nice Nippon piece, very pretty bowl. Um, as you can see, it's large, it's heavy. A lot of Nippon pieces were heavy. Some of them were just paper thin too. So with Nippon porcelain, you don't go by weight alone. Some of the best stuff was heavy. Some of the best stuff was light, hard to tell. That's pre-war, um, definitely pre-war. Then after the war, when uh, we, well, during the war, we did not have access to Nippon or Noritake or any of the, oh, and those are, are by the way, uh, Nippon just means Japan in Japanese. So that's their export mark. They didn't write Japan in English at that time. They wrote it in Japanese in English characters. And Noritake was one of the major factories, one of the major porcelain factories that produced this porcelain. And then uh, Mieto took over. So that is a more recent uh, version of Noritake. And it's one of the reasons that Mieto pieces look like Noritake pieces. You can look at something like this and, you know, you, you look at a piece of Mieto and you say, oh my goodness, they're virtually identical. Um, early Japan, early 20th century Japan imports were pieces like this. Um, sometimes pieces with highly uh, decorated floral designs, very I don't know. European is the word that comes to mind. It was as if they were attempting to anticipate the tastes of Westerners and fill that void. Some very beautiful pieces, very collectible pieces. Um, if you want to collect pieces like this, if you plan to pay more than a couple hundred dollars, get an expert to look at them. Always. Because Nippon Noritake, some of the major uh, Japanese pieces from the, uh, the early 20th century, 
there were a lot of fraudulent marks. <coughs> so it's worth your while if you're going to pay serious money to get an expert to look at the pieces. But for our purposes, we are not paying serious money. So the pieces that we are seeing are not pieces that it was worth anyone's while to fake, which is why we don't have to worry about that. Um, after the war, when U.S. troops were in Japan, the marks changed and they were occupied Japan. And that is becoming incredibly collectible. And it's pieces, this is not, this is just marked, well, where are we? One of these. One of these is marked Japan, I don't know which, but it's not marked Occupied Japan. Uh, Occupied Japan pieces, however, look very similar to this. One of the, uh, the key features in modern, which is to say post-war Japanese porcelain, is, as I say, that beautiful sort of uh, a paint that looks more like blush than a paint. It's soft, it has very soft edges, one color moving into another. Occupied Japan did not last long, just a few years, and then the Japanese, um, the, well, the U.S. pretty much left the Japanese to their own devices, and they began doing what they had done for hundreds of years, which is produce great porcelain. We saw some great stuff come out of Japan during that period, and we saw some terrible stuff come out of Japan. This is a piece of, ooh, a piece of Japanese lusterware. Very nice piece um, in terms of the composition, uh, the colors, in terms of the execution. No, not so much. You can probably see where the paint, I mean, it's, it's smeared. Um, a piece like this, and again, this was a Goodwill piece. I probably paid a dollar or two for it. The value on a piece like this is not going to be anywhere near what it would be if it were actually well executed. So just in terms of value on a piece like this, I would say we're looking in the 10 to $15 range because of the execution problems. Um, meanwhile, our little mouse is probably worth two to three times that because it's better executed. Um, let me show you some other salt and pepper shakers because I ended up getting a bunch of these um, bunnies, very cute. Um, this is not the same artistic style as you can see. Nevertheless, it's characteristically Japan wear. The very glossy glazes. Um, and again, the whimsy. Um, this is not high whimsy. This, this is high whimsy. This is low whimsy. Whimsical pieces, nice. Here, the squirrels. Um, the bunnies and the squirrels are probably going to people who are simply collectors of animal figurines and, um, and are interested in adding them to their collection. If I were to throw these at, at auction on eBay, I would say, realistically speaking, somewhere between ten and fifteen dollars for either of these, because these are going on my Etsy shop. Uh, I'm not even sure I'm going to break even on those. It's okay. Like I say, it was sick cat money, so I'm all right with that. Um, these. This is another pair. very Japanese. Um, the interesting thing about this is we're starting to move away from the Western whimsical aesthetic and getting into pieces that are a little more Asian in their feel. Um, it's one of the things I like about this particular set. 
um, this, oh, eBay auction, 15 to 20 at most. Now, one of the things, I've turned some of these up, one of the things you may notice is they're missing their corks. Most of them were not. Here are their corks. These corks are crumbling and degrading, and usually what I do is replace them with modern corks. In this case, because I actually have whole corks, I will include the original corks when I list these items for sale. But I'll probably add some modern corks. Um, and people have said, you know, what about the plastic? No, in my experience, people who are buying items from the 1950s either want a real cork or no cork at all. What they don't want is a plastic stopper because they're buying a vintage piece and they don't want they don't want to add on parts that make the piece look modern. So the whole go to Amazon and get some plastic stoppers, no, no thank you. Uh, I can get corks for um, very reasonably priced and I, I can get them in a variety of sizes. I usually keep a bunch of them on hand. As you can see, I've got some for these. Not a big deal at all. The person who buys this doesn't want plastic. So that's how I'm going to go on this. Now, let me show you some other items. Japan, lusterware. Pretty little piece, just this blue band is a very, this iridescent sort of bluish purple. Very common color in luster wear. And let me show you. Same color on this. But this one, however, is quite modern. Um, this one undoubtedly goes back uh, at least... 50 or 60 years. So they've been using that blue. Here's, here's another bit of that. There are some colors that are extremely common in luster wear. It's this peach band. Right, I'm going to take a look at this. Right here. Little peach band along the bottom. Luster wear from the 50s and early 60s very typically has three colors. This blue, the white, the peach. Doesn't mean they all have it. Um, this piece has the peach, peach and white. This has the blue. It's just the colors that you want to look for. If you see peach, white, and blue, you're probably looking at luster wear, especially if it's got this beautiful iridescence. Um, do you want to pick this up? You bet. This one was another interesting piece. Now, this one you did see on a Crazy Lamp Lady video. Here, let me turn that around so you can see it. Um, because I was very confused by this little, apparently, mustard pot. I had started to wonder if this actually wasn't heading toward Australia and that was not the Vegemite pot. Scary thought. But in the U.S., we keep salt, pepper. Um, generally, we don't keep a pot of mustard on the table. That's just not a typically American thing. On the other hand, it may well be common in other countries. And who knows? what country this was originally destined for. This is lusterware. This is nicely executed. It's cosmetically in good shape, but the gilding is rather worn. Piece like this, if I put it up to auction, because it does have the caddy, and it does have the mustard pot, and it does have the lid, although it does not have the spoon, I do not believe the spoon would have been porcelain. I believe the spoon probably would have been wood or plastic. 
piece like this, hard to say how high it would go. And that's because of the caddy and the mustard pot. Uh, just the salt and pepper shakers, if I would take these out, these alone, we're looking at maybe 10 to $15. The whole thing could go 50 or more. Um, but again, that's not where it's going. These are going into my Etsy shop, and my Etsy shop is not designed as you know, a profit-making venture. We're not going to just make billions and all run off to Rio together. It's used to fund the projects, to fund the giveaways, and to pass the, the savings that I got when I made good deals on these pieces along to others. That's what's making me happy. Um, this is also a Japanese piece, and this is of a very different character. This is the sort of Japanese import piece that came in pre-war. Um, now, this piece is not pre-war. This is certainly most likely mid-century, but it's very reminiscent of the pieces that were coming in in the 20s and 30s. Japanese porcelain, we didn't characterize it as Nippon because it, it doesn't have, well, look, there's very little in the way of artistic similarity between these pieces. So we usually just characterize this as Japanese import wear. Again, really nice piece. The Japanese got a very bad rap in the post-war years, and, and it was just a small chunk of the post-war years when made in Japan became synonymous with junk, crap, etc. It was unfortunate. Um, frankly, their country had been bombed back into the Stone Age. They were recovering. There were going to be consequences. They put their they put their industry back together very quickly, and they began exporting some really great stuff. So I've got one more piece, and actually this is in my Etsy shop right now, but I think I'm going to take it down and keep it. I think it's going to be mine. Uh, it's just beautiful. This is undoubtedly from the mid-century, but it's got beautiful Art Deco lines. And I love it. Well, I say it's undoubtedly from the mid-century. It actually could be an Art Deco piece. Um, one of the things I've noticed in dealing with Japanese porcelain is because their aesthetic is very, very sympathetic to mid-century modern and Art Deco. Sometimes it can be a little hard to tell. But again, nice piece and... It's that beautifully blended color that appeals to me. And unfortunately, I do not get to keep all the deco I want because I do not have an Art Deco themed household. Although, if we look at the stove, oh yeah, all right, fine. I've got some Art Deco pieces. I sneak them in when I can. All right, we've got a little bit of business to do. I hope this has answered some of your questions about Japanese porcelain, why I buy it, why I think you should buy it, um, and we'll talk about. We are still doing our beautiful pen giveaways. As you can see, I've got plenty of them. If you or someone you love needs one of these great pens, right into the comments. We're giving them away at about four a week. So right in, I'll be pulling names again. And hopefully everybody who needs a pen is eventually going to get a pen. And then it's going to be just everybody who wants a pen. Um, these pens are provided by Lisa of Desert Dragon Works. Go check her out on eBay. Um, no, I'm sorry. Etsy. Her store is Desert Dragon Works on Etsy. You can find her on Facebook and Instagram as well. And while we're on the subject of Lisa, let me show you the set of flatware she did. This is completed now for Renee's sister, Nancy. 
Um, I'm sure you'll remember that. I gave you a little uh, sneak peek at one of the pieces. So this is the completed set of flatware. Now, the next picture coming up is the new set that Lisa is starting. And Lisa is doing this just to provide useful flatware for people who have um, arthritis, carpal tunnel, whatever. She's just doing this out of the kindness of her heart. So thank you, Lisa. We're going to be doing those as a giveaway. Um, and as this progresses, I'm going to sort it all out. Here's the one you've been waiting for, though. Voila! This is our Louis Vuitton bag. And it is done. Oh, and by the way, if you don't like the color, guess what? You know how to change it. So... This is our Louis Vuitton handbag giveaway contest video. Um, tell me a funny thing that happened when you were on vacation. It can be anything. Try to keep it short because i got to read all these. But that's our contest. Just a cute, funny vacation story. You know, like the time you went to Oakland, California, and your luggage went to Auckland, New Zealand. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So, make me smile contest rules below as we all know contest is open to all residents over the age of 18 of planet earth which means you can live anywhere we're not going to be able to send you the bag but i will be able to send you something that the tax man won't have a fit about all right thank you so much for all being with me and we will Oh, we'll see you tomorrow. Ha, huh, I keep forgetting. Yes, we're doing Monday videos too. Yeah. Oh, senility strikes, doesn't it? All right. See you tomorrow. Yeah. As soon as I turn the camera off, guess who came to visit? He'll see you tomorrow too.